TorahCafe.com. So a few years ago, before I became editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, back then I was uh, the military reporter for the newspaper. And as a military reporter, I often had the opportunity to uh, be a fly on the wall in uh, different interesting events, scenes, or environments. And one day I get a phone call and I was asked by the IDF spokesperson if I wanted to join the then chief of staff, the Ramat Khal, of the IDF, of Tzahal, whose name was Benny Gantz. You might be familiar with him today. He's uh, running to be prime minister in our do-over election because we couldn't get it right in April, so we're trying again in September. Maybe we will get a government. We won't get a government. We'll become like Italy. Who knows? But anyhow, uh, if I wanted to join Gantz, he was going on a tour of the West Bank Palestinian city of Nablus in the area, Shechem, what we know as Shechem. So I meet him out near Shechem in, in a IDF base, join up with his jeep, we travel around the area, we go to a, uh, a nearby overlooking position, observatory position of the IDF where there were soldiers from the Golani Brigade who were keeping an eye on what's going on in Nablus. And if you remember Nablus, back in the time of the Second Intifada, so that Palestinian uprising and cycle of violence that erupted in 2000 after the failure of the Camp David talks and led to the murder of over a thousand Israelis. But back then, Nablus was the hotbed, was the origin of many of these Palestinian suicide bombers. But I'm talking to you 2013. So this is after the second intifada is over, but we're out there and Israel's still vigilant, watching over the city, making sure the terror is not emanating from it is not coming from there within to Israel's own border. So we meet with the soldiers, we hear some intelligence briefings, we of course have lunch. And also remember that 2013 is a period of time that the whole region is in a major unprecedented upheaval. The Arab Spring had broken out just a couple years earlier and we see in Syria Assad fighting for his life and down in Egypt Mubarak had been overthrown. All the countries throughout the region are teetering on possible survival or just being toppled. And we finish up and we get into his Jeep. We're driving back to the helipad to take a helicopter back from the West Bank to Tel Aviv. And as we circle around in one of these dirt roads, which really looks like the Wild West, as some people often sometimes refer to you, Davashim to Judea and Samaria, otherwise known as the West Bank, Gans tells his driver, stop the car. The driver says, what? He says, stop the car. Stops the car in the middle of nowhere. He says to his assistant, give me your phone. He calls up the officer, this colonel, who he had just moments ago bid farewell from, who had given us that tour. And he says to him, Nimrod, that's the name of the officer, my jeep has been hit by a roadside bomb. One of the soldiers has been injured. And... Uh, sorry, one of the soldiers has been abducted, I'm injured, you need to get here, and he slams the phone shut. And I'm sitting there just watching. Gantz gets out of the car, sits on a rock, starts twiddling with some straw piece of whatever that he found on the floor, is looking at, he was, all these IDF generals, if you ever see them, check their watches. They all wear these silver Breitling watches. I think they get them when you become a aloof, you become a general in the army. So he's looking at his watch, he's counting down the minutes, and then I start to hear a buzz in the air. I look up, I see drones. Then you start to hear rumbling. I look off to the side, you see the armored personnel carriers from the IDF start to converge on this dirt road. The soldiers jump out, they're carrying their Tavor Israeli-made assault rifles. Inside their jeeps and inside their armored personnel carriers, they have these plasma TV screens on which they can see the location of every other Israeli force, soldier, jeep, tank, helicopter in the region, in the area. And if they get, if there's an enemy that they happen to detect, all they have to do is hit the screen and that location of that enemy is then transmitted to every single friendly force that's in the region. Drill's over, right? The soldiers come, they say, is everything okay? Of course, no one was hurt, no one was abducted, there was no roadside bomb. And I said to Gantz, what, what was this all about? And he says to me, when you look around us today, 
And this was true back in 2013, and I think it's still very much alive and true today, is that we live in a region full of uncertainty. We don't know when conflict will erupt. We don't know where it will come from. What region, what border, what frontier? Will it come from Syria? Will it come from Hamas and the Gaza Strip? Will it come from Lebanon? Or will it be some Palestinian attacker who grabs a kid, a 19-year-old boy, walking down a road in Gush Etzion, like he did last week, Devir Sore, carrying a book which he had just bought to give to his Rebbe in the yeshiva that he was studying at just outside of Efrat, and stabs him to death and kills him on throws the body on a dirt road. Where will that next conflict come from? We don't know, but we have to be ready because it could break out at a moment's notice. And that was interesting, and that was an interesting lesson. But what I also saw that day was the amazing technology that the Israeli military has developed, has manufactured, has created over the years, and how it plays into these threats and to confront the different challenges that Israel faces around, around, across its borders. I saw the drones that were flying overhead. I saw that amazing plasma TV screen system that I called you. It's called Sayad. In Hebrew, Sayad is hunter. In English, it's called the Digital Army Program. It's one of the most sophisticated internal sensor, computerized digital systems that exist in any military. Israel has sold it across the globe. And the Tavor assault rifle, so in Israel, when I was in the army, we used to carry around M16s, right? Which we bought from your surplus M16s after the Vietnam War. But nowadays, Israel has developed its own assault rifle. The M16 has troubles, it sometimes could get jammed, dirt, moisture, whatever. So they built, they developed, an Israeli company developed the Tavor, which it now has sold across the globe. Anywhere you go in the world, some places that aren't the best of countries maybe, but anywhere in the world today, you'll find some of these Tavor assault rifles. So I asked myself, how did Israel come to be the country that's developing some of the most sophisticated military technology in the world? How is it that Israel continuously ranks in the list of countries that export arms and weapons in the top five, six, seven countries selling annually somewhere from seven to eight billion dollars in weapons around the world? How did this happen? So I want to take you back 50 years. In July of 1969, almost exactly 50 years ago, Israel flew the, its first drone over the Suez Canal. But how did, when did this begin? So in 1967, in the Six-Day War, as you all recall, in six days, Israel tripled in size. It went from being a tiny little country that had been established in 1948 to conquering the Yudav Shomron, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, West Bank from Jordan, reuniting Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip and the Sinai Peninsula from Egypt, and the Golan Heights from Syria. But Israel found itself facing a unique problem. As it deployed on one side of the Suez Canal, that famous waterway, right, which connects basically Africa with the, rest of, with the, with the West, it found itself that it was on one side of the Suez, and the Egyptians were on the other side of the Suez, and it couldn't see what was happening just over the Suez Canal. And was Egypt again preparing for a new war? So the Egyptians had built up this 10 meter high, about 20, 25 feet high mound of dirt on their side of the Suez, and the Israeli soldiers were trying to see, are there tanks, are there armored personnel carriers, are there artillery batteries, are there soldiers? What's happening there? They couldn't see anything. So one guy came up with an idea, We'll build a watchtower on top of a tank, and we'll peer over the border. So that worked until one day an Egyptian sniper opened fire. That guy got shot, so they figured they can't do that anymore. Then they said, okay, we'll fly our fighter jets high above the border. They couldn't cross into Egypt because of the terms of the ceasefire, but we'll fly them at a high altitude on an angle, and we'll, we'll attach a camera, we'll take some pictures. Pictures come back, can't see anything, nothing. So they come up with the master plan. The Mossad, Israel's equivalent of the CIA, sends a spy. He flies from Tel Aviv to Europe. From Europe, he flies to Cairo. From Cairo, he gets in a car, drives all the way up to the Suez Canal, takes some pictures, drives back to Cairo, flies back to Europe, and Europe back to Tel Aviv, all to see what's happening less than a football field away. Insane. So one day when he comes back and those pictures get developed, 
inside the headquarters of military intelligence, what's known as Hebrew, in Hebrew as Agaf HaModi'in, in the army, in Tel Aviv. If you're familiar with Tel Aviv, near the Israeli towers, those two big office towers, now three actually on the side of the Ayalon freeway, just across the street is the main military headquarters. And they come back with these photos, and they see that the Egyptians have brought this land bridge, you know, one of these bridges that unfolds and can cross a waterway, that there are tanks there, armored personnel carriers, and they start to go crazy. What's happening here? And there was this one officer who was in that room who said, this is ridiculous. To see what's happening just over there, we have to go like this, send a spy to Europe, to Cairo, to go. It's just there. On his drive home, he lives in Mifaseretzion, still around, been to his house, he, right outside of Yerushalayim, he remembers that he had seen a movie just a couple weeks earlier. And I'm told back then in the 1960s, before my time, actually today's my 40th birthday, by the way, thank you very much. <laughs> but uh, um, he, back in the 1960s, when there were movies, before the feature film, they used to show a newsreel. And in the newsreel of that film that he had seen, they sh it showed an American Jewish kid who for his bar mitzvah had received a toy airplane as a gift. And all he remembered was that the toy airplanes came with a remote control and they were wireless. That was it. To make a long story short, Israel eventually, you couldn't even get toy airplanes in Israel back in the 1960s. Right? They weren't available. They sent a guy from the Israeli defense delegation at the, at the Israeli consulate, right, which is now on 42nd and 2nd in Manhattan. They sent him to FAO Schwartz, right, which now reopens somewhere else, right? It used to be on Fifth Avenue over there. FAO Schwartz, he bought a couple of toy airplanes, a couple of spare propellers and tires. They flew them in the diplomatic pouch back to Israel because they were concerned that people would say, why in God's name is an Israeli flying with so many toy airplanes back to Israel? Brings them to Israel, and in July of 1969, they took a camera, they attached it to the bottom of it. This isn't like drones today that you could take a picture with a button, so they just put it on a timer, right? And they flew it over the Suez Canal in July of, I think it was July 8th or July 9th, 1969, exactly 50 years ago. The pictures came back, they were incredible. They were able to see amazingly what the Egyptians were doing along the Suez Canal. They could see the cables, the communication cables that the Egyptian army had dug connecting the different positions it had established along the Suez. Why is this an interesting story? Because this was the first flight of a reconnaissance drone, not in Israel, in the entire world. Israel essentially invented the drone. You think of what happened on the shores of the Suez Canal 50 years ago, which began with a toy airplane bought here in the United States, and you look at Israel today when it exports over a billion and a half dollars annually in drone technology around the world. You look at the use of drones in Israeli military operations, they're everywhere. There's no operation today that takes place in the IDF that doesn't include whether it's a tiny little drone that battalions or companies, a small group of soldiers can carry with them in a backpack and launch or with a catapult, or if it's a drone that is one of these strategic drones like the Heron TP that can stay in the air for 72 hours straight. And these are the types of drones that are rumored to be carrying out the attacks that Israel doesn't deny it does, doesn't confirm, doesn't, doesn't deny that it's behind it, but doesn't confirm that it does do it in Syria or in Iraq or other places across the region. Here's another story. 1977, Anwar Sadat makes his famous trip to Jerusalem, right? Israel discovers and Israel understands that peace is coming. And if peace with Egypt is coming, what that essentially means is that Israel's going to have to pull out of the Sinai Peninsula. But again, we're facing a similar problem. If we pull out of the Sinai, Egypt, the largest Arab country in the Middle East, the biggest foe, enemy, adversary of the Jewish state, if we pull out of the Sinai, we won't have that buffer between Egypt and potentially and possibly attacking the state of Israel. So there's one officer who comes up with this idea that he knows and can figure out how Israel can keep its eye on what's happening in Egypt. We can't just fly drones over Egypt after we've pulled out of Egypt. Israel's going to build a satellite. People looked at him. Then the chief of staff, the Ramat Ka, was this guy by the name of Raful Eitan. I forget the exact Yiddish phrase. Maybe someone can help him. Go. I think it was like... Gut uh, flashed or something like that. It was like hot air. How do you say hot air in Yiddish? There's a way for saying what? Look. 
Luft, luft, something luft, yes, thank you. But I mean, they used a Yiddish phrase to write them off, to say this is nonsense. Israel, tiny little Israel, less than 30 years old, we're going to build a satellite? Now, go back in time. Who back in the 1970s had satellites? It's not just about building a satellite, it's about being able to independently launch it into space. Who had satellites back then? America, the Soviet Union, Russians, the Chinese, the Indians had just launched a satellite for the first time, the UK, Israel's going to build a satellite? I mean, it was, it was, it was mind-blowing. But Israel went ahead and did it and succeeded. And 10 years later, in 1987, Israel launched its first satellite into space. And today, we have over 10 satellites in space with the ability to watch and see anything that's happening throughout the region. I can tell you, some of the satellites you can imagine just use a camera. right? High resolution, are able to see small objects on the ground. They're amazing telescopic cameras. But we even have satellites that use what's called SAR technology. It's a radar technology, because imagine for a moment that there's fog, or it's winter over Tehran, and you want to see what's happening still. Are the Iranians moving forward with their nuclear program? Are they not? Are the Syrians deploying ballistic missiles, or aren't they? You can't see, as good as a camera as you are, you can't see through a cloud, right? So they developed this radar technology that can create images of high resolution, like a camera, but without using a camera. So it can see through clouds. It can see through even non-concrete rooftops. I mean, it's amazing what it can do for Israel's intelligence gathering capabilities. And you know how Israel launches its satellites, by the way? All across the world, when you want to launch a satellite or anything into space, you fly in the direction of the way the Earth orbits, rotates, right? Because you want to get the thrust together with the rotation of the Earth. Now, think of Israel for a moment. What is to our east? Jordan, Iraq, Iran. Now imagine we launch a satellite and it accidentally doesn't make it into orbit, right? And that satellite lands somewhere, or that missile lands in Iraq, Iran, or Jordan. We could have a bit of a problem on our hands. So Israel launches to the west. This is the only country in the world that launches westwards to the Mediterranean, which means that you have to have the thrust and the boost on your launcher has to be so much stronger than any other typical missile or satellite launch vehicle. But again, I want to get back to the question I asked in the beginning. Why Israel and how Israel? What made Israel succeed where other countries didn't succeed? How did this tiny little country, barely 30 years old, barely 40 years old, be able to establish, create, invent this amazing military technology that has literally changed the modern battlefield. So like any good Jew, I'll give you the answer, and I think it's complicated, right? First, I think it has to do with the unique threat matrix that we face in Israel and along our borders. From day one, when the state of Israel was established, when I wrote this book, Weapon Wizards, I spent a lot of time actually with Shimon Peres, and I was fortunate put aside politics for a moment, but I was fortunate to be able to spend time with him because it was just a few months before he passed away in September of uh, 2016. And he was still sharp as a razor. But he told me a story that in 1947, he was living on a kibbutz up in the Bika, in the Jordan Valley. And everyone knew war was gonna come once Israel declares independence. They knew the British mandate was coming to an end. Then, by the way, his name was Shimon Persky. He's a young Polish Jew who had immigrated to Israel. And his kibbutz held a vote one night and decided that they were going to send this young 20-something-year-old Shimon down to Tel Aviv to join the war effort. They stuck a few liras in his pocket, he put him on a bus, he drove down to Tel Aviv, went to what was called the Bayit Adom, the Red House. That was where the Haganah, this paramilitary force, that the Jewish community, the Yeshuv, as it was called, had established and then morphed into what we know as the modern Israel Defense Forces, the modern IDF, had its headquarters. He walks inside and he says, I'm here. My kibbutz sent me to join. What do you want me to do? And they said to him, we don't know who you are. You know, this is before he became the famous Shimon Peres that we all know, the elder statesman, the former president, prime minister, defense minister. 
So he just mulls around. He's got nothing to do until finally a friend of his says, listen, we don't have anything for you to do right now. Go sit in that office down, the corn, down in, at the end of the hallway. It's the, it's the office of the commander of the Haganah. His name was Yaakov Dori. He's out sick today. Sit. Take a seat behind his desk. Okay. So Shimon Peres goes there. And Shimon Peres, if you ever had a chance to hear him speak or hear his stories, had a lot of chutzpah. Right? And he's sitting behind this desk. And he starts opening up the drawers to try to fill his time. He opens up one drawer and he sees an envelope inside. Now, I don't know if I would open up the drawer to begin with, right? He opens up the drawer. Then he finds this envelope addressed to David Ben-Gurion, right, who was the head of the Jewish community, the head of the Jewish agency at the time, the Sukhnut, the Yeshuv. So he looks at this letter and he decides, you know, I'm going to open the letter. Right? So he opens up this letter addressed to David Ben-Gurion. And inside this letter, he gets the shock of his life. It's a letter that had been written by another commander of the Haganah who had been offered to serve as the first chief of staff, the first Ramat Kal of the soon-to-be-formed IDF. And in this letter, this officer writes to Ben-Gurion, I'm honored, I'm flattered by your offer to appoint me to be the Ramat Kal of the new soon-to-be-formed IDF, but I have to decline. Why? I've discovered that in our arsenal, we have exactly six million bullets. And according to my calculation, We'll need one million bullets a day in the war that's going to come. And I don't want to be the chief of staff just for six days, right? It's not worth it. It's just because that's all we're going to last. That was the feeling back in 1947, 1948. They were making bullets. If you've ever been to Israel near Rehovo, they were making bullets in these underground bunkers hidden by laundry mats and bakeries because they, with lipstick uh, cover casings because they couldn't get their hands on weapons. But somehow Israel survived. Somehow it persevered. And the question is again, why? So I think from day one, when you look at the story, it's not just the story of the modern state of Israel, but it's the story of the Jewish people. It's a story of a people that has always had its back up against the wall. It's a story of a people that has always faced adversity, persecution, whether it's being kicked out by the Spanish from the, you know, during the time of the Spanish Inquisition, whether it's being evicted, just we commemorated Tisha B'Av just earlier this week, whether it's you know, being, going out to Galut and to exile from, from our homeland. But that persecution, that adversity, when your back is up against the wall, you have no choice but to innovate. You have no choice but to be creative. The man who came up with the idea back in 1977 that I told you about to build the first Israeli satellite told me a great line. The shadow of the guillotine sharpens the mind. And it's so true. It does. Because when you think about Israel, I always say, Baruch Hashem, thank God that we found gas now. Right? If you're familiar, Israel's found loads and loads of gas off the shore in the Mediterranean which apparently is going to bring in hundreds of billions of dollars. No Israeli taxpayer yet has seen any of it. I, I, I just feel like I pay taxes all day, but maybe it'll do something for the country. But it's supposed to, I mean, we're selling it to the Egyptians, to the Jordanians. It's changing the whole region, geopolitical significance. Imagine for a moment we had found this gas back in 1948. We wouldn't be the startup nation. We'd be no different than all of our Arab neighbors, like the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, all the Qataris, all of these loads and loads of oil whose whole economy is dependent on one single resource. Our country was also dependent on one resource. But you know what that resource was? The Jewish brain, the Jewish cup. That's what enabled us to be able to evolve, to develop, and to become the most amazing, innovative country and people that we are today. That's answer one. Answer two is, we have to what time, sir? 11.10. 11 10. Okay, I'm going to get to questions also, so I'll wrap up. Answer two is that we lack structure, right? We're a people, this is, jacket is a lot for me to wear, but you know, you go to Israel, people don't wear jackets. You know, people, people don't dress up. People are very, as we say in Hebrew, dugri. They're very straightforward. There's even in the army, right, which is an amazing institution in Israel, because when you think about it for a moment, what's a military supposed to do? It's supposed to embed within you or create for you a hierarchical structure, discipline, right? When I was a soldier, I did my basic training in August, the heat of the summer, on, near, in a place called Nitzanim, just near Ashkelon. Forget about the flies that wouldn't leave us alone, but it was so, so hot. But they wouldn't let us wear sunglasses. 
right? Because when you're in basic training, you got to stand. Then you, you know, in Hebrew, we stand in, in attention in a chet, in the, the shape of the Hebrew letter chet, right? Which is like an N, just a small N. And they wouldn't let us wear sunglasses. And then at some point towards the end of basic training, we're gathered in this chet, standing at attention for our commander. He says, from today, you can wear sunglasses. He said, why can we wear sunglasses? And there's a, it's because we were now going through the ceremony in the IDF called shvirat ha distance, right? Distance, you know, shvirat is break. It was breaking the distance between you and your commander. Now think about that for a moment. The Israeli military has a ceremony where it breaks down the distance, the discipline, the structure between you and your commander. There was a story I'll never forget that Ron Kaddish, Ron Kaddish was lieutenant general, general in the U.S. Air Force. He was the head of the Missile Defense Agency, the MDA. And back in the 1990s, he was the, in charge in the U.S. Air Force of the F-16 fleet in America. And there were major problems with F-16s. They were crashing, they were encountering a lot of malfunctions and difficulties. And outside of the U.S., the country with the largest fleet of F-16s is the state of Israel. So he flies to Israel to meet with some of his counterparts. He goes to a base called Tel Nof, not far from Tel Aviv. He's brought into this room, this boardroom. He's meeting with his, he's a, one, he's a colonel. He's meeting with a one-star general who's the commander of the base, a bunch of soldiers, some non-commissioned officers, Air Force pilots, etc. There's, you know, barakas on the table, some bitter Turkish coffee. They're sitting around. They begin their discussion. And then in the back of the room, some guy starts yelling at the Israeli general, yelling, arguing, screaming at him. It was in Hebrew, so he didn't understand. So he whispers to the guy next to him, who is that guy? Right? He's thinking, if he's a, a one-star general, that guy must be like a three-star general, right? If he's yelling at him. So the guy next to him says, oh, no, he's a mechanic. <laughs> right? So he says, to, he says to himself, in the U.S., they take that mechanic outside, put him up against the wall, and shoot him. I mean, you know, but court-martial the guy. And here in Israel... The one-star general is arguing with the mechanic, and they're screaming at one another. So some people look at that, and they say, how does this work? But that's also a strategic asset, because when you don't have that structure, you can have a free flow and exchange of ideas and information. When everyone, or almost everyone, serves in the IDF, right, we all speak the same language. Everyone understands what people are talking about. And therefore, that creates this commonality and this ability to exchange ideas without having these hierarchies, not having to salute. You can just talk and explain and debate together and argue. That is something that also enables Israel's success. There's one other thing, and that's responsibility at a very young age. In the Israeli military, you could have kids who are 18, 19, 20, who are leading troops behind enemy lines. There's a story I remember I used to work for, uh, I spent a couple years in government, uh, and I worked for a former minister who's now again running for the Knesset, Naftali Bennett. You might have heard of him. He was just, until recently, Israel's education minister. But Bennett once told me a story. He was a commando in, uh, in a unit in Israel called Sayer and Matka, which is the general staff reconnaissance unit. These are the guys who did the Entebbe raid back in 1976, right? Famous for some of the most amazing of Israel's operations. And then he finished up the army, went to law school, never practiced as a lawyer. I also went to law school, never did anything with it, but made my mother happy, I think. But um, he then founds a high-tech company with a couple of his friends. And they end up selling it for $170 million a few years ago. Uh, before he goes into politics, it does like fraud detection for online banking. But they had just created the product. They're here in the United States, and they're about to go into their first pitch to the Bank of America. And they're shaken with fear. Is it going to go well? Are they going to succeed? Is the company going to take off? Are they going to make the deal, not make the deal? And he, and this, I mean, this is what he tells me, that he's looking at his friends, and he's thinking to himself, what's the worst that's going to happen? They're going to say no. Is anyone going to walk on a mine and get killed? Is anyone going to get shot? Is anyone going to get hurt? No. The worst that happens is they say no. But that experience, because Israeli soldiers face that adversity, it makes them willing to take risks, to gamble with technology, to do things like create Iron Dome, create a missile that can shoot down another rocket, two little pins flying in the air at record times, 
which is astounding. Or just a couple weeks ago, we had that test in Alaska, in Kodiak Island, right, where the Arrow 3, Israel's high-level, high-tier ballistic missile defense system, shot down three incoming missiles, ballistic missiles, out of the atmosphere, in space, right, that mocked potential Iranian ballistic missiles that could be fired one day towards the state of Israel. Now, all of this is an amazing story. I could go on and on and tell you stories about technology and the people behind it and how it was made. But sadly, when you look around the region today, we see that what we like to call the QME, the qualitative military edge, which, by the way, is made possible a lot due to the assistance that Israel gets from the United States in $3.8 billion in annual foreign military aid and the ability to buy some of the most sophisticated weapons and military platforms like the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, a fifth-generation stealth fighter jet that Israel has and is already made operational. It's made here in Fort Worth, Texas by Lockheed Martin. But you look around the region and you see that our enemies, whether it's Hezbollah, whether it's Hamas, whether it's anyone else, are trying to undermine that qualitative military edge. You just look at the evolution of the threat that Israel faces from Gaza. Back when Israel used to be inside Gaza, how would they attack us? Roadside bombs, drive-by shootings, suicide bombers. We pulled out of Gaza in 2005. What did they come up with? Qassam rockets. They extended the range of the Qassam. Then they got Katushas. They got even farther. But then we came up with Iron Dome. So they came up with the tunnels. Then we came up with an answer to the tunnels. As, as fast as we are, they're also fast. And they're also constantly thinking up different ways that they can undermine our latest response or answer or solution to that problem. But I always think, and I think there's one other answer to this, and I, and I hinted before. Thirteen years ago, in 2006, Israel was fighting the Second Lebanon War. You might remember. It was 34 days of war against Hezbollah in Lebanon. It was sparked after Hezbollah guerrillas, terrorists, had crossed into Israel on July 12th of 2006 and abducted two Israeli reservists whose bodies were returned two years later in a prisoner swap. But I remember one day when I was up north covering the war for that month-long period of time, which, by the way, that war, on a side note, taught me the true value of Shabbat, I have to say. Because, you know, I kept, I've always kept Shabbat, grew up in an observant home. But that was my first experience of two, two competing uh, desires. One is when there's a war going on, you feel like you've got to be plugged in all the time. right? But then Shabbat comes along. You've got to disconnect. You're not working. And a war, it's not like the war stops because of Shabbat. And if you know anything about the news cycle today. The news doesn't end either. We, it's not just print anymore. I mean, we're 24-7 online. The only day that the Jerusalem Post does not update its website is not 24-7, is Yom Kippur. From, from the beginning of Yom Kippur till the end of Yom Kippur, the website does not get updated. But otherwise, 24-7, Shabbat, Chagim, Rosh Hashanah, Pesach, we got people work the Seder. It's always working. So you got to keep it going. So that's on the one hand, this desire of how, how do I disconnect? On the other hand, when you're a reporter who's covering a war, you don't stop working. You don't sleep. And then you suddenly get this one day that's forced upon you. As, you know, then, as an observant Jew, I'm forced to keep Shabbat. But it made me appreciate Shabbat, the value in taking a day off to be able for 24 hours, 25 hours, whatever it is, to stop, pause, to think about things, to disconnect for a moment. It's an, it's an amazing, if, if God hadn't given to it, it to us, someone should have created it, because it really is an amazing gift. But back to my story. So I'm up, up north covering the war, and I'm in Haifa for some briefings. Now, Haifa was bombarded with missiles during the, during the, the war. The whole north was a, was, a, was a ghost town. And we're getting these briefings in one of these hotels. And there was a break, and I decided to go outside, get some fresh air, walk up the street, and I see there's a flower, there's a, I see off in the distance there's a flower shop, and there's a guy lugging in pots of flowers into the, uh, into the shop, out to the shop, pouring water, moving this bouquet with that bouquet, and I'm looking at him, I'm saying, is that real? There's a flower shop open in the middle of Haifa, in the middle of a war? So I get closer, and I walk over to the guy, and I say, everything okay? Like, what are you doing? I mean, nothing's open, nothing. And he looks at me with a straight face, and he says, Someone might want flowers. And I said, okay, he's Meshuggah, right? He's a little crazy. But then I realized is that with that little simple answer, he gave me the answer of what really is the 
amazing secret to our success. And that is the resilience of the Israeli people, right? That is the ability that you get knocked down, but you get up, you keep on going forward. Nothing stops you. It might be hard. I remember suicide bus bombings, blowing up the 18 bus, whatever bus it was in Jerusalem, coffee shops. But an hour or two later, people are lining up at the bus station to get on the next bus. That's the story of Israel. That's the story of the Jewish people. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. So the Shimon Peres story, I mean, so after he read the letter, then he actually became Ben-Gurion's assistant. And, and eventually, throughout the period of the war in 1948, and that's what propelled him into politics, essentially, he spent that time in the years after uh, procuring arms for the state of, for the fledging state of Israel. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot, he, he flew to places like Colombia, he met with Castro in Cuba, he, 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 he went everywhere possible to buy Israeli weapons, to get Israeli aircraft, to do whatever it took, you know, and, and Bishuto, it, it, because of him, Israel founded not only the Demona reactor, which is something of an insurance policy for the state of Israel, but also Israel Aerospace Industries, which turned into a economic superpower and one of the most leading aerospace uh, companies in the world today, developing some of the most sophisticated tech, uh, technology. But there was one great story that he goes up, so he also has to, you know, Israel doesn't have any money, he's got to raise money, so he goes, he flies to Montreal once. It's like 1950 or something like that. And, which is where you're from. And who is one of the wealthiest Jews, see, I knew you were from Montreal. No, okay. <laughs> Who's one of the wealthiest Jews in Montreal at the time? Bronfman. The Seagrams, right? So who was the prophet? It wasn't Edgar, it wasn't Matthew's the one now, it was the... F Samuel, thank you. So he goes to meet with Samuel. And he says, because Canada had some artillery cannons that they, he heard that they might be willing to sell to Israel if Israel had enough money, but Israel didn't have the money. So he, uh, he goes to Samuel and he says, you know, I'd like you to help me raise money to buy these artillery cannons. So Samuel looks at him and sees the schlepper Israeli guy. And he says, he had this one suit that he wore, but he, he, he sees him sitting down, and he's got, I see, I've learned, you gotta wear black socks, right? Paris was wearing white socks. So he says, so Samuel says, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna do a dinner at home. He calls his wife, he has her invite a list of people who he gives her the names of who they're gonna have for that dinner that night, and no one could say no to Mr. Bronfman, right? And he says to Paris on the way, on the way we're gonna buy you a normal pair of socks. They buy him a pair of black socks. They have the dinner that night. They raise about a million dollars, but they're still a million short. So Brofman says to Shimon Paris, where are you going to get the rest of the million? He says, what do you mean? What about you? And that's how he got the $2 million that he needed to buy those. Uh, I mean, it, these were the stories. This is how they, they, were, they were going around snoring money, buying whatever they could, wherever they could. But that's how Israel got its start. And that's what, that's what Paris did. Yeah. The question is, with all of Israel's might, Israel can't defeat a small terror, I'll just add a little, but a small terror organization like Hamas, which can send balloons and, and, and uh, kites with incendiary, whatever, and burn thousands of acres of land in southern Israel, as they have. Huge challenge, very complicated. Uh, you have to mix, it's not, to, now, because also what's evolved over the years is it's no longer conventional military versus conventional military. It's no longer the Israelis lining up on one side of the Suez and the Egyptians on the other side of the Suez, or vice versa with the, with the, with the Syrians in the Golan Heights. Today we're facing enemies that embed themselves within civilian infrastructure that hide their launchers in mosques, schools, hospitals, that dig tunnels from homes into, into Israel. Right? You know, I mean, Israel's the only country in the world, there's, it's a, it's a, it's, they developed a tactic called Hakesh Bagag. You ever hear this? It's called knock on the roof, right? In 2008-9, in December 28, 2008, Israel launched its first large-scale operation in Gaza after the disengagement, the pullout from Gaza in 2005. And during this, what they decided they did, so they have all the phone numbers of everyone in Gaza, and they know where the homes are of where Hamas is storing its weapons and stockpiles and command centers, etc., so they call up the home, and they say, listen, we know you have a launcher. We know you have this Hamas command post. We're going to bomb your home. Get the hell out, right? 
So people would either listen, but sometimes one day they didn't listen. Not only did they not listen, they climbed to the roof. They knew there was a drone up above. And they smiled at the drone. They said, hey, we're here, kids, people. You're not going to bomb us because they know that we're a moral military. Even though international law says that a civilian uh, building, structure, once it has transformed into a military position, is a legitimate target, but you then have to ask yourself the question of proportionality. So is the value of eliminating that target, does it match the loss of life? So if there's, let's say if it's a hospital, so we knew that Hamas had a base inside Shifa Hospital, the biggest hospital in Gaza, you're not going to bomb a hospital, right? Even though you take out Hamas's command center. So you're always evaluating. So they come up to the roof and they say, one second, how are we going to get these guys off the roof? We've got to bomb this target. So they, they say, one second, we have a missile, a helicopter that doesn't really have any dispersion of shrapnel. It doesn't really do anything. So they quickly put it on. They fly it over it. They fire it into a corner of the roof. People freak out that Israel's actually bombing. They flee the home, and then they bomb the home. So they called it Hakesh Bagag because they're literally knocking on the roof before they're bombing. No other military in the world does anything like that. Nobody. Do we get credit for it? No. Hafuch. People still attack us, no matter how much we do. So the question is even more than that. Is how is even our hands are tied? The world's against us. We've lost public opinion. Look what's going on in the Democratic Party here in the United States. Although, to the credit of organizations like APAC, there were 41 Congress, new freshman Congress mem members of Congress from the, from, that came to Israel this past week from the Democratic Party. So they're not all Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, and, and, and these others, but we have serious challenges. So a conventional military is going to have a problem dealing with balloons that are flying over its borders. And you got to come up with solutions, and they're working on it. They don't have yet a solution, right? But I will say is that despite these challenges and these threats, if you do think about it for a moment, Israel today is not only the strongest it's ever been, but I would also argue that the threats against it are at possibly the lowest level they've ever been. Because what's happened throughout the region with the, the dissolution of these regimes, the Syrian military, which was the last conventional military that we were fighting against for years, has disappeared. There's no military today that, that poses an existential threat to the state of Israel that can conquer territory, that can invade Israel. Iran, yes, one day might get a nuclear bomb, but they're still far away. They're not yet there. So right now in time, it's not actually a bad period of time for the state of Israel. And then the question you have to ask yourself is a little different. So what do you do with this period? Now you have this opportunity. How do you leverage it? That's a different question. Yes, ma'am. The Samson Option. That's the name of the book by Seymour Hirsch, right? About, uh, about Israel's ability uh, or Israel's last resort to one day use a, a nuclear weapon. Israel uh, clearly has built something in the Negev Desert at a place called Dimona, right, where there's a nuclear reactor, um, and is rumored to have 100 to 150 nuclear weapons, but Israel still abides by a policy of ambiguity, where it neither denies that it has nuclear capabilities, but it neither also doesn't confirm that it has them, and still holds by the policy of it won't be the first to introduce nuclear weapons into the Middle East. And that's been the policy since the time when Golda Meir met with JFK here in Washington, D.C., and basically agreed that that would be the case. I think that it creates, it helps Israel establish a deterrent. It made it clear over the years, the one time that's documented that Israel was close to possibly using it was during the Yom Kippur War, when Moshe Dayan genuinely felt that this was the end of what they called the Bayit Shlishi. It was the end of the third commonwealth of the Jewish people, right? The modern Jewish state. And then there were, it was documented that there was, it was brought up, but it was shot down. They decided not to go with it because then Israel was able to fight back and gain territory again. I think the policy of ambiguity has been effective for Israel. I think it's worked for Israel. I have a different problem about that as a journalist, I'll just say, that I think that because of the, the, the way this whole issue being shrouded in secrecy, we don't have transparency, we don't have a clear discussion of how would it work, when would it happen, who has the authority, what's the chain of command, things like that. It, 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 it's a problem, I think, in a democracy. Right? That's a separate issue, though. It's not, so that's what I could say. I would hope we would never have to use it. Uh, people have suggested 
that Israel could create with the Iranians what Robert McNamara, the former defense secretary here in the United States, coined the term MAD, Mutual Assured Destruction, and that if the Iranians one day develop a nuclear weapon, why is it a problem? We have nuclear weapons. We could unveil some capability of ours. They'll see that if they attack us, we'll attack them, and we'll have mutual assured destruction like work during the Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. That might work, but it might not. Because we don't know, are the Iranians rational actors or are they not? Do they believe in the fifth imam that will return and I don't know what he'll do, right? Or do they appreciate the value of life like we do? I would say no. And if there's a 5%, 10% chance that one day they would potentially use a nuclear weapon, that 5%, 10% is too much for Israel to live with, right? And if you come to my talk in the afternoon, I'll talk about my most recent book, which is called Shadow Strike which tells the story of how Israel destroyed Syria's nuclear reactor and fits into the, that more into the question of how it did what Menachem Begin did in 1981. Sorry? No, there was a, sorry, nuclear reactor in Syria in 2007. It had destroyed, but also in 1981, it bombed a nuclear reactor in Iraq. And now you have to think about what it might one day do with Iran, but we'll talk about that in the afternoon. Thank you all very much.